Hello, in this video we will be talking about the changes in Latin America during the Cold War era. And this presentation is brought to you by Kevin Osterberg, Augen Licardo, and Nihal Cachigada. First, let's go ahead and start off and jump right into the economic changes. Well, this is following the Great Depression and two world wars, and this is where most of the economic change has truly come from. The Latin American country's strategy for economic growth consisted of economic di diversification, as they realized that if they just focused on one resource or one part of the economy, such as agriculture or strict natural resources, if something goes wrong in that one department, they are essentially going to go down and they realize that decline if they only rely on one um, economic factor. In addition, they also utilized Import Substitution Industrialization, also abbreviated by ISI, which is basically a trade and economic policy which advocated replacing foreign imports with domestic production. Now this would lead to an increased GDP as they had more domestic reliance and didn't have to spend so much money on importing most of their goods. Now, if they produced more domestically, their people could purchase them for lower prices and they would have more chances to export goods rather than having more imports. They also wanted to integrate multiple, the multiple economies of Latin American countries because similar to the ideals of the EU and NAFTA, they believed that their economies would be stronger together and they could focus on the strengths of all of them and sort of tie it in, kind of going with economic diversification as each country kind of had um, a main specialty, although some of them were very similar. In addition, they also utilized internal structural reforms, which basically just fixed some of the small things inside their governments and social, political, and economic ideals of their country. And these small changes could go and range from infrastructure to budget spent on industry, agriculture, and so on. In addition, in the small Caribbean and Central American republics, as well as some of the South American nations, the expectations for ISI were limited by market size and other constraints. And the government still hesitated to promote manufacturing at the expense of national items and materials. They were also not exactly, they weren't the biggest countries yet and their population growth was still developing. Therefore, even though their domestic um, production might have increased, there was not enough people to buy that and seriously sustain the economy in that sense. In addition, where there were countries with, like I said, unequal population or not as much, and the GDP couldn't exactly match that, they utilized tariffs, subsidies, and official preferences to really build on that. And the use of tariffs, although small, was utilized as any... Um, any kind of interaction with foreign countries, those small tariffs that they must pay really kind of supported the economy in a safe sense. In addition, subsidies, which are um, a sum of money granted by the government or anybody to assist an industry or business so that the price of their product may remain lower competitive, um, that kind of gives them incentive to, to actually raise their industry and economy and produce that good. Also, starting in 1960, with agreements that supported an economic union, such as the Latin America Free Trade Association and Central American Common Market, this was kind of another thing that brought these nations together, similar to how NAFTA brought uh, Mexico, U.S., and Canada together, and the EU, EU brought most of Europe together. These organizations and associations um, really brought them together. And as we mentioned in the last slide, um, economic integration and having multiple Latin America countries come together was a big focus and goal for Latin America at this time. More specifically, the American Free Trade Association and Central American Common Market both focused on free trade to facilitate regional economic development. Moving on, centering in Cuba, we're going to talk about the Cuban Revolution. Well, Cuba was one of Latin America's most highly developed nations by the mid-century, and as you know, Cuba was also had very, very big involvements in the Cold War era, more specifically with the Soviet Union. Uh, at the same time, in I guess the post-war period, um, they still maintained that power and that superiority. Therefore, Cuba little, had little to no economic growth, which is kind of ironic. 
with their big part in the Cold War. And as we should know as well, they did have sort of kind of a political issue here. They would had a very corrupt political dictator. Now, the Cuban Revolution also had also achieved major advances in health and education, but this was at the expense of economic gains. There were certain things that had to be sacrificed to improve the lives of the people. And again, improving the lives of the people was another big thing that the dictator could do to keep his place in power. Now, because of Cuba's advancements, Cuba was actually still looked up to by many other countries. Although their economic position was not its best, it was still revered. And they were revered because of their social achievements, as well as their leftist political parties that usually won in voting elections, if it was not a dictatorship. And because of these social advancements, and this was superior to those of the others, and they looked up to it, and they looked up to how, um, quote-unquote, successful it was in comparison to their own country. Let's talk about debt. With trying to build industries and globalization and bringing everything together, debt will come. And because of this, let's just say Latin America was in a severe economic crisis because of their economic debt. However, the countries of Mexico and Brazil kind of supported and brought that debt as not as much of a pressure because... During the 1970s, oil prices were very high, and with Mexico and Brazil being a very important petroleum exporter, um, organizations such as OPEC and the Seven Sisters really allowed for their exports to, I guess, um, supplement Latin America's debt and reduce it and kind of support Latin America's economy com from completely failing. In addition... Latin America experienced bankers that often used aggressive tactics into pressuring Latin American governments to borrow money, and the region's total foreign debt even increased from 1970 to 1980 by more than 1,000%. Now, that is a lot to multiply by, and the banks were pressured by this economic crisis. As the world around it developed, Latin America would soon experience a rude awakening, because it was kind of in a slump right now, although it tried to rise. With economic development and industry comes population growth. In addition, public health also increased. Therefore, there was more health standards and health opportunities, and this increased the life expectancy as well as the population. Now, due to the population growth, more schools were built in order to expand knowledge and further educate individuals. And this can be seen in many countries as education increased, jobs usually increased, and more higher standard jobs. Therefore, the level of economic development of the country would increase as well. Now, security improved as well, lowering the crime rate, crime rate and kind of increasing the social standard. And I've got to say, although the economy was in a slump, their social standards have increased a lot. Except that their social inequality had increased as the rich became richer and the poor kind of stayed the same if not declined as most of the benefits went to that upper class and this can be seen as um, through the Latin American city model as there are regions in a city where there's more economic development and they're striving with an upper class in addition in addition to a center of the city where there are slums and very poor people. Now, political changes. These Latin American countries were moving toward democracy and as we can see before, US has been a driving factor of globalization and these South American countries were moving towards the US and they were really looking up to them. And Mexico devised a unique system of limited democracy that was built and founded by the Institutional Revolutional Party. And Colombia became a more conventional democratic party after the bipartisan coalition, which was known as the National Front, that expired in 1974. And Costa Rica and Venezuela had similar processes as Colombia. Now, the significance of Costa Rica, Venezuela, and Colombia is not just that they're not just there were similar processes, but the fact that these South American countries were coming together and following each other to 
influence each other and benefit all of them together and completely rise as whole, influencing that whole continent, all these South American nations. And that was a very, very interesting part on how they function and how they really try to benefit everyone at once. There were also some political changes. A doctrine called populism, which is a doctrine that appeals to the interests and conceptions to the general population, is commonly used. And we can definitely see that even today in U.S. elections, um, as they really looked at what the people wanted, told them what the people wanted. For example, they promised social justice without class struggles and an increase in industry and military power. And this is somewhat similar to how revolutions start as they imagine all these reforms and new, I guess, more utopian-like standards. However, not all of these can be accomplished. Um, others who practice populism were known as populists, were the leading part of post-doctoral Venezuela. Venezuela was a very big part and demonstrator of populism as their country was built off these uh, envisions that their country can do better and that's what got these populists in power. In addition, there was Christian democracy. For example, Brazil with such a heavy Roman Catholic population, it, it overwhelmed not only Brazil but also Latin America and these Christian democracies were basically small splinter parties who offered programs inspired by this Roman Catholicism. In some way, it's similar to populism as they appealed to the needs of the people, but this was more centered on Christianity itself. And this can be seen in Venezuela, El Salvador, and Chile. There was also bureaucratic authoritarianism. Um, well, Salvador, I'm sorry, Salvador Allende of Chile combined a Marxist assault on the owners of the means of production with populist lab populist lavishing of short-term benefits on his working class followers. So basically, he used um, very controlling methods to control the production of his country as well as appeal to the people. So he attempted to get the best of both worlds. In addition, military rule really overwhelmed a lot of these countries in Latin America as many military leaders um, took hold of dictatorships and presidencies. Now, bureaucratic authoritarianism really focused on enforcing strict obedience to authority, especially the government, at the expense of personal freedom. Now, this was seen as a favorable, I guess, government type because this provided a very centralized government and it was more controlled. And I guess some people envisioned this as being able to benefit the nation and go in one direction. Thank you for watching and I encourage you to go through the video if you have missed any points or just want to look over some points. In addition on this subsection of the website I also encourage you to go through the assessment and the activity to further your knowledge in this topic. Thank you for watching and see you next time.